Welcome to The Big Story with me, Olivia Quay. Now, we just learned a short time ago that the cafe, one of Singapore's oldest cinemas, will cease operations from June the 26th. In a statement by media company MM2 Asia, which runs the cafe Cineplexus chain in Singapore, the closure is part of the cost rationalisation process for its cinema operations. And just to be clear, the building itself is not closing, just the cinema. Well, here's more with our film correspondent, Don Louis. Don, can you underscore the significance of this cinema closing? Okay, first I have to make a tiny correction. The closure is from June 27th. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll still be open on June 26th. Um, but yeah, the the cinema itself is uh, you know part of the entertainment landscape of singapore for many singaporeans it's been around since 1939 a lot of us uh, grew up with it so it has a place in all our hearts i see well john i i understand that the local independent cinema the projector is will be moving into the space that was occupied by the Cathay Cineplex, but that doesn't seem that it's going to be permanent, right? No. So um, what's going to happen there is that you know it, the projector, as you know, has a main location at uh, uh, the Golden Mile on, on Beach Road, and it runs a couple of uh, what they call pop-ups. So one's at Riverside. Mm -hmm. And what this will be is, is going to be another pop-up. So uh, it's going to exist there for a few months, but uh, what happens after that, we don't know. But uh, like you said, the rest of the shops and restaurants in the building will not be affected. What's really happening there at uh, the, the cafe is the fact that they've got two cinemas on Orchard Road. One is at Cine Leisure, and of course, the other one is that Handy Road. So they decided that uh, maybe it just doesn't make sense to have two businesses sort of, sort of cannibalizing from each other. And uh, they decided to make the decision and close the smaller place down, which is the one on, on Handy Road. Yeah. So the, the business has been, uh, as you know, been rocked by the COVID-19 pandemic, which saw the closures uh, either during the circuit breaker period or the reduced capacity because of social distancing that was lifted on April 26th. But, and then also all the blockbusters got held back. We are beginning to see them slowly coming in. And as uh, Cathay and as MM2 Asia, the owner of the Cathay Cine Leisure, uh, sorry, the Cathay Cineplexus brand has said, um, since April 26, the, the easing of the safety distancing restrictions, the market or the patronage, the patrons have become, begun to come back almost to pre-COVID levels, but they're still, you know, they're still in the process of trying to recoup some of the damage done. Thanks to film correspondent Don Louis for that update. We have been discussing today's announcement that the iconic cinema, the Cafe, will be closing on June the 27th. Well, let's move on. In a surprise move, HDB is changing the criteria for replacement flats under the Selective on Block Redevelopment Scheme, or SERS for short. Starting with the Yang Mo Kyo SERS site announced in April, homeowners will only be able to sell their units five years from the date of collecting the keys. Previously, owners could sell either seven years from the date of selection of the replacement flat or five years from the date of collection. Housing correspondent Michelle Ng is here to elaborate. Michelle, why the change for the SERS replacement flats? Is there something in particular that HDB is trying to address? Mm, yes, I would say that um, some people have thought that the OMOP criteria had some sort of a loophole that benefited owners who bought SERS replacement flats from the HDB. So prior to this change, there were two MOP options for this group of owners. And I must specify that this only applies to owners who had their old flat flats picked for SERS and then decided to buy a new replacement flat at the designated site offered by HDB. 
Um, so the first M MOP option was pretty standard, five years MOP from the time you collected your keys. Um, this is the same as all other BTOs and HDB resale flats out there. The second option is the one that gave this group of owners a little bit of a head start and early MOP, some people would call it. So this option is um, seven years MOP from the date the owners selected their replacement flats. And this seven years usually includes the construction of these new flats. So between these two options, whichever is earlier would be your MOP. Usually for a large group of SERS owners, they would reach the seven-year option first. So this means um, factoring in, say, a four-year construction period, owners will only need to live in their new replacement flats for around three years before they can sell it on the open market. And this is where the loophole is. Um, so this three-year old flat with a remaining lease of around 96 years, it's obviously going to be more attractive to buyers because it's practically new and they may be able to command a higher resale price. And this is actually what happens in the HDB resale market nowadays. Just last month, a five-room flat at Henderson Road, which is between Red Hill and Chong Baru MRT Station, sold for a record $1.4 million. And this flat, what's interesting about this flat is that it only had 96 years left on its remaining lease because it was a search replacement flat for the Red Hill Closers project in 2011. So by removing this seven-year MOP option, which is what HDB is doing today, um, and standardizing the MOP to five years for all future search projects, essentially H what HDB is doing is, is they are closing this loophole, and some people would say make it fairer for everyone. Well, Michelle, let's find another example. Um, mm -hmm. The four blocks in the Ang Mo Kyo SERS site. Now, they are the first to fall under this new criteria. So, can you map out the process or timeline for those flat owners from when their blocks are selected for SERS to when they select and move into their replacement flat and when they can sell that unit? You're correct. So, the first SERS site that will fall under this revised criteria is the Ang Mo Kyo SERS project. Um, actually, there will be a second one. The, the second one will be the nine HDB blocks in Marceline. Those will be acquired by the government to make space for the expansion of the Woodlands checkpoint. But that's uh, like a whole month after um, the Amokyo SARS project. So taking this Amokyo project as an example, um, HDB timeline tells us that owners will be able to register for new replacement flats um, early next year in 2023. So if the previous option of the seven-year MOP was in place, their MOP would likely be around 2030. But now, after the revised criteria, their MOP would only be around 2032, which is a whole two years later than what it was previously. This is because the flats are, will only be completed around 2027. So yeah, that's, that's the difference there and that this group of owners will only be able to sell their flats two years later um, after this revised change. Michelle Ung there, The Straits Times' housing correspondent. Job vacancies have hit yet another record high as the labour market continues to tighten. The number of job openings rising to 128,100 in March up from 117,100 in December. The ratio of vacancies to unemployed persons also grew to 242 positions available for every 100 unemployed persons. And this is the highest since 1998. According to the Manpower Ministry, the bulk of the vacancies were in construction and manufacturing, mainly for non-PMET roles typically held by migrant workers. This should improve in the second quarter with the return of workers following the easing of border restrictions in April. Meanwhile, resident employment comprising Singaporeans and permanent residents has exceeded pre-pandemic levels, rising in financial services and information and communications, but falling in consumer-facing sectors. Retrenchments fell to a record low of 1,320 individuals. And Manpower Minister Tan Si Ling says he's pleased to see that the labour market continued to improve on all fronts in the first quarter of 2022. 
and the government will continue to support companies to upskill their local workforce to help them adapt to new growth areas and meet the labour demand. I'm now joined by Patrick Tay, Assistant Secretary General at NTUC. Patrick, job vacancies are rising and there are more openings than unemployed people. But with the economy facing pressures on growth and inflation, do you see the labour market cooling as well? I think looking at this morning's uh, re labour market report for the first quarter by the Ministry of Manpower, I think overall we are seeing very positive signs, uh, sort of like a turnaround uh, based on retrenchment numbers, unemployment rates, uh, as well as employment numbers are, are overall looking positive. However, I think uh, what lies ahead remains a lot of uncertainties and of course risk factors. I think there are several. Uh, firstly, uh, the Russian-Ukraine war as uh, will we'll, we'll have some impacts uh, in the short term, medium term, as well as longer term. Uh, secondly, uh, inflation. I think inflationary pressures are, are in, in, you know, exacting on many countries, including in Singapore, uh, and, and fueled by, for example, energy prices, fuel prices, as well as commodity prices because of supply chain challenges. Thirdly, cost of living. I think cost of living is something which uh, is impacting uh, many workers and Singaporeans in particular. And, and well, there are also other factors such as uh, disruption, transformation, as well as reorganization that's going on. And uh, all these together with structural uh, unemployment challenges will, will, be, will have impacts on the labor market. So on the whole, I would say uh, moving ahead, the labor market will be an uncertain one. We can't say you will totally uh, cool off uh, because there are actually certain sectors which are, well, which is, we see strong growth and hiring demand. Uh, especially sectors that are supporting some of the growth industries. Uh, we have saw in the report, financial sector, ICT, healthcare, social services, and of course the pickup uh, with open travel lanes uh, across the globe, aviation, including hospitality, tourism, sort of coming back uh, uh, in, you know, into space, uh, into the space, and, and really I, I see sort of like an even kind of a labor market outcomes in the second half of the year. Well, Patrick, of course, it's tough to plan for the unexpected, but given the uncertain picture, what's your advice to employers and workers? Yeah, I think uh, definitely, uh, well, expect the unexpected. We have, we have had enough of curveballs the last uh, two and a half years. I think moving ahead, uh, what lies ahead is, is of course, uncertain. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are risk factors. So I think employers and workers alike really need to stay re really relevant and resilient. I think ready with new skills, relevant for the new jobs they are created uh, with digitalization, transformation and restructuring. And of course, uh, you know, resilient to the changes. Uh, we do not uh, know what will happen in the next three, six months, uh, depending on what's uh, the geopolitical situation and what's happening around the globe. But definitely we know there are exacting pressures uh, uh, at all fronts. I think one of the big uh, biggest feedback I get from union leaders uh, as well as uh, uh, residents as well as many Singaporeans is the rising cost of living and inflationary pressures. I think this is something uh, I, you know, uh, which uh, is impacting all of us. I think important uh, for everyone, uh, particularly when making, making major uh, investment decisions, major purchases, major consumption, uh, to, to, to be mindful uh, particularly and also careful at the same time. Many thanks to Patrick Tay, NTUC's Assistant Secretary General. Meanwhile, in a sign of economic health, Singapore's non-oil domestic exports comprising electronics and non-electronics rose 12.4% in May compared with a year ago. This follows five months of slower growth and is better than the 7.5% median forecast of analysts polled by Bloomberg. In other news out today, new efforts to reduce the five-year reoffending rate for, of former prisoners. Minister of State for Home Affairs Mohammad Faisal Ibrahim says plans include setting up a network for ex-convicts to provide support for those who are still rehabilitating. A new community mobilization plan will also help to equip the community with skills to support inmates. Figures show that 41% of those who were freed in 2016 reoffended within five years of their release. Some roads near Marina Bay will be closed tomorrow due to a National Day Parade rehearsal at the floating platform. 
The police says to expect delays on Raffles Avenue, Tomasic Avenue, Bayfront Avenue, Raffles Boulevard and Republic Boulevard. For details on the affected roads and the hours they'll be closed, head over to straightstimes.com. Holding a joint news conference in Kiev with Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky and other European Union leaders, French President Emmanuel Macron says France, Germany, Italy and Romania are all in favour of Ukraine receiving immediate official candidate status to join the EU. Ukraine's application is likely to be given the green light when EU leaders gather for a summit on June 23rd and 24th. But membership will come with strict conditions, like a roadmap. It will also involve taking into account the, the situation in the Balkans and the neighbouring areas. An Uzbekistan man who hit his wife at their wedding has been charged with hooliganism after the June 6th incident went viral, making international headlines. If found guilty, he could be fined or spend up to 15 days in detention. Another committee in the Uzbek legislature's upper house says the man has apologised to the bride and expressed regret at his actions. They have reconciled and now live together. In sports, four seasons since they last won the NBA title, the Golden State Warriors are lifting the trophy once again, beating the Boston Celtics 103-90 in Game 6. Stephen Curry, who scored 34 points in this one, was named MVP of the finals. Hard to believe, but it is the first time he's won the award. These last two months of the playoffs, these last three years, these last 48 hours, every bit of it <clears throat> has been an uh, emotional roller coaster on and off the floor. And you're carrying all of that on a daily basis to try to realize a dream and a goal like we did tonight. And uh, you get goosebumps just thinking about, you know, all those snapshots and episodes that we went through to get back here individually, collectively. And uh, that's why I say I think this championship hits different. That's why I had so many, so many emotions and still will just because of what it took to get back here. Well, those are our top stories today. Visit straightstimes.com for more news and our YouTube channel for more videos. Subscribe by hitting the red button below. I'm Olivia Quay and I'll see you soon on The Big Story. Have a great weekend.